the Southern Ohio Farm Show. This is Gigi Neal of OSU Extension in Claremont County, Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. Well, I'm James Morris, the Agricultural and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator for the Ohio State University Extension in Brown County. Hello, my name is Richard Purden. I'm with the Ohio State University Extension. I am the Ag and Natural Resources ed Educator for Adams County and the Community Development Educator for Adams County, Ohio. And I'm Brooke Beam, the Ohio State University Extension Educator for Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development in Highland County. And we will be your hosts for the Southern Ohio Farm Show. So this week, I'm going to start a new segment that we hope to continue throughout the summer as part of a resource that I'm trying to create for Brown County and really for Southern Ohio as well. So this information can apply of course, specifically to Brown County, but also across some of the Southern counties as well. And it may be a, a great resource for Northern counties as we're developing issues down here. And that's going to be a resource of reports from the field. And these are some of the, the things that I'm seeing while I'm out on field visits that I get called out to, or just on some normal scouting that we're doing across the county from North to South. And typically in a year, we get several calls out to farms and we identify a problem whether it's a pest or a fertility issue. And we have a great conversation between myself and the producer, but then we don't expand that conversation out to help others. And I wanna do a better job of that. So we're going to create a resource that hopefully can serve as a communication web for producers and extension educators throughout the, and throughout the state and throughout the county. And on our website, on our Brown County website, you can use the quick link at go.osu.edu slash field report. And this is going to be a combination of what we've already been out to, for example, some alfalfa fields, grass hay fields, corn and soybeans of different types of production practices from um, continuous no-till to some utilization of cover crops. And especially as you are entering maybe as a new production method or you wanna see how others are doing in the county, it'll be a good benchmarking program for you too as well to see what others are doing and we can learn from each other. And uh, I think that's a very important piece of the agricultural industry, whether you're in it professionally or you're into it actually in the production stages. We all have coffee shop talk and hopefully this is a way for us to, to kind of continue those conversations on some educational material from OSU Extension from what we're seeing from the field. So we're gonna start the conversation off the day with bean leaf fields. Uh, we had a field of soybeans planted in the Georgetown, kind of south of Georgetown into the Ripley area that was planted April 28th. And we had decent emergence. We have variable uh, emergence throughout the field in some of the low lying areas. It got wet and cool, but overall the field came up really well. And we started seeing feeding as early as the VC stage. And as we took a closer look, we could see some bean leaf beetles that were already in the adult stage. And, and some of us may wonder how we already have these insects in the adult stage this early in the spring. We typically see this later in the summer. Well, bean leaf beetles will overwinter as adults throughout the, throughout the winter here in Ohio, and they continue right back where they left off. So we already see them in that adult stage that they overwintered in. And some of these early planted soybean fields kind of serve as a trap crop for them because that's their main source of food in that area especially if it was in soybeans last year. So they already have that food source coming back to them again this year. And the good news is we typically don't see much of an issue as far as defoliation to the extent of yield damage. Now, we have to see really at this early stage before we get into pod set or flowering, reach a 40% defoliation. And we're only seeing about five to 10% um, in the early May, and as we get into the second, third weeks of May, we were starting to see uh, some of these begin into maybe the 10 to 20% range. But the, the corn or the Ohio corn soybean and forage field guide is a great resource to use. It has a defoliation guide that you can use to base on your management decisions. Now, as we get into later growth stages of soybeans, as we get into pod set and flowering, our threshold does lower there a little bit as we do run the risk of creating some seed quality issues and, and pod feeding as well. Now, looking at this, we, we are concerned about defoliation and yield, but also quality because uh, bean leaf beetles can vector and spread 
being pod model virus, which can kind of cause that stay green, as many of us just kind of use it as a general term there, they stay green, our soybean plants stay green and even throughout the relative maturity into the later part of the season, and it can cause seed quality issues. So we wanna make sure we keep an eye on that. And we do have a resource that's available for several different insecticides that can be used. But as we look at some of these different thresholds, if we're going to be sampling and scouting for these, especially in late June when that first generation develops. So we have an overwintering adult that'll be dying out hopefully pretty soon here um, in the next couple of weeks, if not already has, has died out. And then by late June and July, we'll start to see that generation from those overwintering adults who so are first generation developed into late June into July. Then we'll start to see feeding damage. That generation will live, die, and reproduce, or reproduce, then die. And you will start to see that second generation develop into late August into September. And that's when we start to see some of our pod feeding develop. So into June and July, we can use periodic sleep net sampling to get an idea of how much we have of population in the fields. And the sweep nest sampling should be done by taking 10 sets or taking sets of 10 sweeps at three to five different locations within a field. And if we're going to do our defoliation assessment, we're going to take 20 random samplings from plants and, and pull these from the soil and estimate the percent defoliation made. And we need to be careful when we're taking these, these percentages to take the entire plant throughout the field, not just the top third of that plant, because that damage will be more severe than the top third. So we want to make sure we're sampling the entire plant and getting an estimation of the entire defoliation across the plant. So I mentioned the different thresholds as we reach different stages of maturity throughout the plant. And when we're still in that vegeta vegetative state prior to pot bloom, our threshold is 40% defoliation. Once we get in that bloom to pod fill stage, that's our lowest threshold at 15% defoliation. And then after pod fill to plant yellowing, so as we reach that later maturity stages, 25% defoliation is our threshold. And at those thresholds or over is when we want to think about providing a rescue treatment. And as we get into pod injury, to sample for those, we should be basing that on inspection of all pods on 10 randomly selected plants. And once each of those plants are sampled, count the number of total pods and the number of pods exhibiting pod injury. And then that way we can determine that percent of injury based on those 10 plants that we've sampled. Again, and it's important to estimate that percent of pod injury based on the entire plant and not just that top one third and not focus on the heavily, most heavily infested areas of that plant. Treatment again here will be justified if percent pod injury, not leaf defoliation, if percent pot injury is reaching 10 to 15% and the bean leaf beetle adults are still active in feeding. So keep in mind our, our thresholds change throughout the season and also for defoliation versus the pod, pod, pod damage. <laughs> so if you would like more information or if you have additional questions, please be sure to reach out to your local extension office and ask for help. But keep in mind, you can also find all the information that I provided today and the information that I used came from the bean leaf beetle on soybean fact sheet that we have here at the Ohio State University. And that can be found on our ohioline.osu.edu website. And that has information on management, scouting, and the insecticides that can be used as well. Now, I also mentioned that we had already been out to some alfalfa fields this year and found some alfalfa weevil damage. And we worked closely with this producer to determine the, the total amount of population in that field and also work on some management steps as well. And we really started seeing alfalfa weevil what seemed like pretty early, but we had some of those 80 degree days there early in the year we, and then we cooled back off, but they kind of gave these alfalfa weevil a jump start. So when we talk about alfalfa weevil, growing degree day units are very important because because we all know that a calendar year is never the same from year to year, uh, just like this cool down we had this, this uh, last week. It felt like fall after we've had a whole week of 80 degree days. So we really have to pay attention to our growing degree day units. And we actually have a resource through Ohio State where you can type in your date and your zip code and it can give you the total accumulation of growing degree day units that we've had in that location so far. 
So at the time I made this visit on May 7th, we had 419 growing degree day units. And we can start seeing the third end stars of alfalfa weevil appear at about 325 degree units. And we did, that's the case here. We'd already had probably a couple of weeks of feeding based on the uh, scouting of this field. And we found several of the alfalfa in the larval stage. And you can see how small they are. They're very hard to small. And just looking through the field, you're not going to eyeball them off the plant and just be able to count them that way. So a good way to do this is to take about 30 plants from the field, place them right into a bucket and be careful when pulling them that you don't shake the larva off and put them in a bucket, come back and you shake each of those stems out real nice and, and carefully to keep them inside the bucket and be pretty rough with them to shake them all out. We dump them out onto a black sheet there. We have a nice solid, it could be white, whatever the solid background would be. And we count the total of, the, of those alfalfa larva in, in, the, in the bucket. And if depending on the stage of the plant and height, in this case, we were up above 12 inches definitely and probably going up above the 16 inch stage by this time in May. So at that point to reach a threshold, we have to be above at least two if we're over, if we're at 12 inches or more than four larva per stem if we're over 16 inches. So you can see that chart there has a nice explanation of the height per inches and then how many larvae you find per stem based on that height and it gives you an action there to take place. So we can, at this stage, we were pretty far along. We could look at our early harvest, um, and that's what this producer did. He, he harvested as soon as he could and to avoid some of that further damage. And we get a cold growth spell come back in after this, and it slows down that growth of that alfalfa. We have to be really careful because our growth's not going to outrun the feeding damage. Um, now we found only one per stem, in this field. So we weren't, we, we had about 30 to 31 larvae in the bucket uh, that we could count. So we weren't extremely high. However, the feeding damage was a little bit more than probably what we would like. So keep in mind, this chart is just a guide. Uh, ideally, we, this works out in the perfect scenario, but we only had one per stem, but we still had quite a bit of feeding damage. So we still wanted to get in there and harvest early. But again, like I said, if something prohibits, weather prohibits you from harvesting early, and there's going to be a cool slowdown and that growth is going to slow down, may have to look at making a, an application of an insecticide. And again, the extension bulletin here has a nice layout of some insecticides that can be used. Again, we have to just abide by the label, read the label before using any of these uh, insecticides. So as we get into the next couple of weeks, this field was harvested on May 19th at 646 growing degree days. And the, the harvest went well, and we went back out to be careful here. You have to make sure you go back out after you cut to make sure there's not additional feeding from still some of those early stages of instars or that third instar feeding on that uh, alfalfa. In this case, we didn't see any second or any regrow, any feeding on the second growth. And we actually found a lot of those adult cocoons where they, were, they are turning into the adult stage. And you can see them here on that alfalfa plant, but also within several places under the canopy of the alfalfa. So that's a good indicator. We're reaching that adult stage. And once we see those cocoons developing, those, they're net-like cocoons. And really alfalfa weevil in the adult stage does not do um, any significant damage to the plant. So we're more concerned about that larval stage. So at this stage, we, we really didn't have a whole lot more to worry about as far as alfalfa weevil goes. The, the feeding did slow down. We didn't see any additional feeding on the regrowth. Now, if we had, we had harvested back in May, early May, on that, we'd have to watch the regrowth very carefully. And at this stage now, we just continue to keep monitoring now for potato leaf hopper in alfalfa. And we'll be sure to keep you updated on what we find here in Brown County on, a, on potato leaf hopper. Welcome to Farm Science Review. Thanks for joining us again, everybody. We're out here in the agronomic crop plots looking at the cover crops. If you've been following us throughout the past year, 
Um, we planted some different cover crops out here. The section we're going to start out in is the inner seed cover crops where we planted into corn at about V4. Uh, we planted a lot of different species out here, but very few of them, one grew and even less of them then overwintered. Uh, so when you look behind me and across this plot, the ones that did really well was annual ryegrass and red clover. Um, they grew very well, we could see them early on and they've shown up really nice now and providing excellent cover. That red clover has some potential to produce a little bit of nitrogen. If you're going to be planting corn after corn and you're utilizing cover crops, uh, we're probably going to want to think about killing that annual ryegrass though here pretty soon. One challenge many producers have with annual ryegrass is getting it killed in the spring. Uh, you got to have some really warm weather and it's got to be vigorously growing in order to kill it. The other crops we had some success with is the cereal rye. Um, you can see that it's in some clumps. It didn't really come up in a solid stand, but it did grow in spots. Uh, the rapeseed also grew, um, did fairly well. Again, it's in clumps a little bit, but it would have made an okay cover crop. Uh, if you were following us before, we had some radishes out here that grew. They've been winter killed. Um, a few other things, we had some other clover species and some other turnips and things that didn't grow well at all. So really, overall, the four best cover crops we found in this section of inner seed was the red clover, annual ryegrass, seal rye, and rapeseed did okay, but not the greatest. So last time we were out here, I talked a little bit about the weather, how we had some freeze, but not a whole lot there in mid-January. Well, right after that in February, as a lot of you across Ohio and the Midwest experienced, we had some cold temperatures. We had a 15 day stretch where it didn't get above freezing at all. And we had a good three weeks, maybe even four of solid snow cover. So that really uh, did a lot of, to go through these cover crops and finish off what was kind of hanging on. And one of those was the radishes. If you go back to our video just before this, those radishes, they were starting to die. You could kind of wring them. They were wet and sloppy, but they were soft. Well, here today, this one, you can see there's not much left of it. There's hardly any weight. It's really uh, dried out and decomposed. They've left holes in the ground. Well, and um, that's one thing that we talked about with radishes being able to get down and break up some of that compaction. You can also see here uh, the rapeseed that survived, um, the sun hemp sticks, and we mentioned some of that last time as well. But what I want to point out here is some of the weed control that we got compared with the plots where we don't have any cover crops. There's not nearly the winter annuals present in here, and we've seen a little bit of research indicating that they do offer some weed control. While it's not complete, it will help especially with those winter annuals. Now moving forward with this project, we have some plans to do some things this spring and into the summer for you to come out and see at Farm Science Review. We're going to do some planting green into some of these cover crops. We're also going to get a roller crimper out here and see how that does as far as terminating the cover crop and then planting into that type of situation. So come out here in September and check that out. All right, we moved around a little bit over here. At here. Um, we're out here in a multi-species area where we have strips of different species growing, some that overwintered and some that didn't. Uh, we have some turnips here, two different kinds. Uh, this one here is a forage turnip and the other one's an apen turnip. And they actually overwintered really well. Now they were planted uh, late July, so it had been similar to the time frame where you would have plant after wheat. So if you planted those species and they overwinter, which isn't every year, but this winter they did with that good snow cover, uh, you're gonna have those bulbs to contend with, but if they're at a low seeding rate, that might not be a problem. Some of the other species we have out here, cereal rye, of course, that was a little bit early for establishment of cereal rye, but it overwintered very well. Uh, followed by crimson clover, also overwintered very nicely. Um, and then we get into annual ryegrass. Um, it overwintered very well. Did some root dig there in the annual ryegrass. It has a really nice, fine root system. Uh, actually, when I was digging in the annual ryegrass, we found an earthworm right there in that spot without even trying first hole we dug. Uh, so, you know, they're building that soil biological activity. 
Uh, Red Clover, another one overwintered well, has a nice root, nice root system. Uh, we have some hairy vetch planted. Again, it overwintered. It's got a really thick mat to that hairy vetch, so it's really providing a lot of ground cover there. Uh, that mat, you're gonna have to plant through a lower seeding rate, it might not be quite so bad, but it's got a really nice fibrous root system going on. Uh, and then we have some more of the radishes, which did not overwinter. Um, those are all dyed, gonna be really easy to plant through. Beside those, we have uh, rapeseed. Uh, did a little bit of root dig there in the rapeseed and got a nice root system on it. It's not that fine roots like the hairy vetch or annual ryegrass had. It's more of a thick root system going down, helping to loosen up your soil. Um, after that, we have some balanza clover that overwintered. And then as we kind of move on across, um, we had some sorghum, which winter killed, breaking down uh, very nicely. It's going to be on a nice dry day, very easy to plant through, just breaks up really nice. And then beside that's a patch of oats. Um, that oats has also died off. It's kind of matted down against the ground, going to help protect the soil from the sun, uh, rain splash, and going to help catch, hold some of that soil moisture and keep your soils maybe a little bit cooler throughout the summer. Uh, and should be fairly easy to plant through on a dry day. Thanks for joining us out here at Farm Science Review this year and watching these cover crops and stay tuned as we get started on our 2021 planting season. We've got a lot of excellent demonstrations planned for you and plan to see you out here in September. Hello again, I'm Dave Apsley. I'm a forester and a natural resources specialist with Ohio State University Extension. Today I'd like to introduce you to a very unique shrub it's called sweet shrub, common sweet shrub, or Carolina allspice. It is a native to the eastern United States. Most, most range maps show it from Florida up into about Ohio, and most do include Ohio in those range maps. Uh, when we look at the Woody Plants of Ohio book, there's a dot in Meigs County. Uh, some of the maps show also Athens County, but when I look, throughout the internet and do some searching, I can't find much evidence that this plant has been found in a wild population in Ohio for some time now. But it is one that can do quite well here in Ohio. We are probably close to the northern extent of this species. But what makes it unique are these beautiful flowers. Multiple petals coming on about this time of the year. It's April 24th and they're just loaded with these flowers that are just getting ready to fully open. A few were actually burned by the frost that we had in the last couple days, but most of the flowers look perfectly fine and look like they'll fully develop. But lots of petals and sepals that are dark maroon in color, um, they're absolutely beautiful. They have a very wonderful aroma, but they only give off that aroma when they first open up. Also, the twigs have a very similar aroma. The flowers will develop this fig-like looking pod that can be quite large and it'll be produced later in the growing season. As far as ID characteristics for the foliage, it is opposite, so that makes it relatively easy to identify. So the leaves are going to be in pairs, they're going to be opposite. The keys say it can be up to th three to six inch leaves. Um, I'm thinking the three inch is going to be more, much more normal for this species. Um, when you flip them over, they can be a little bit hairy on the underside. They'll come to a nice acute or sharp angle at the tip, typically. Another great ID characteristic is, again, they are opposite. And at the nodes where the leaf buds are and where you have twigs that are branching off in opposite directions, we tend to have a very swollen node. You also see some very small white dots along the twig of this or lenticels. The twig also has a spicy aroma. And then finally, it's a shrub. It's a shrub that gets probably up to about 12 feet tall. I planted these years ago, and they're probably six to seven feet in height now. And what makes them very nice is they'll spread. You'll plant one or two individuals and they'll spread and colonize. So they are a great option if you're looking for a native plant that's good for pollinators, something that does quite well in shade or partial shade. I'm in an area that when the full leaf out occurs, this will be almost total shade. And this plant, which I planted two or three right here, has now spread to make a nice mass. Again, this is sweet shrub 
or Carolina allspice, a great native plant, a native shrub to consider for your landscape. Thank you very much. Have a great day and be sure to spend at least part of it in the woods.